My name is Trish Saunders. I am Associate Director of Admission and Financial Aid at Concord Academy. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm so pleased to help facilitate this evening's program focusing on our math, science, and computer science programs. So I'm going to start um, this evening by just letting our um, panelists tonight introduce themselves and maybe if you could each say your name, your department, and any other roles that you have at CA. Um, so why don't we start with Will. Um, hi everybody, my name is Will Tucker, uh, he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I'm head of the science department. I am also a chemistry teacher, a house affiliate, chemical safety officer, and co-scheduler. Thank you. And Kim? Hi, I'm Kim Kopelman, and I teach biology and chemistry in the science department. And I also am a ninth grade class advisor and the academic support center coordinator. Thank you. And also from our science department, Susan? Uh, hello, I'm Susan Flink. I use she, her pronouns, and I teach uh, chemistry, um, chemistry of cooking and developmental biology. And I also wear the hat of advisor to CASA, our Concord Academy Students in Action, which is a community service group. Thank you. And Ben. Hello, everybody. I'm Ben Stumpf. Uh, you see him pronouns. I am the head of the computer science department. I also um, teach in the art department. I teach film and graphic design. Um, coach the girls varsity soccer team and assistant coach this ultimate frisbee team here and run the model UN program. Thank you, Sean. I'm Sean Bartok. Um, he, him pronouns in the math department. Um, in addition to teaching, I also live in one of the houses as a house faculty. And George. Hi, my name is George Larravee. I use he, him pronouns, and I teach in the math department, and I am a house affiliate in Wheeler House, and I am also the faculty advisor to the Big Data Club. Thank you. And George, I think I'll have you um, stay unmuted, and I'd love to have you give our audience an overview of the math program at CA. Sure. Uh, so th the math program is... Uh, it's a very broad program. Uh, it uh, starts out with uh, allowing students to come in wherever they, wherever they, where it was most appropriate for them. Uh, and so we have students starting at many different levels. Uh, and then we sort of guide them through the curriculum, uh, through a couple of different pathways. Uh, some students who are really gung-ho about math, they can go an accelerated path. And students for whom, you know, maybe, maybe math is not their favorite thing, or maybe they just need a bit more time to digest the, the concepts. Uh, we have a regular path. Uh, and then they come back together for these upper level courses. And so we have a number of uh, upper level courses that, you know, that it, uh, like, you know, the standard calculus, uh, but we've got courses beyond the calculus. We've got other courses like uh, discrete math, mathematical modeling that have lower requirements, but that allow the student to see math, uh, math really interesting applications of mathematics. Uh, the graduation requirement is to take uh, algebra two and one course beyond it. So the, the, the graduation requirements aren't that, aren't that student, but the, but most students go well beyond that. Uh, let's see. Um, we, I would say, I think one of the things that is, is really terrific about the math program is that besides the, you know, the broad, uh, the, you know, the range of courses that we have is the flexibility uh, that we allow students, you know, there are students who maybe decide that they want to go, they start in one path, but they find mm, maybe this is the right path for me. Uh, maybe the accelerated path was just, you know, a bit too much to take. And so they decide to move over. Yep, they can absolutely do that. Uh, if sometimes students are in the regular path and they say, you know, I would like to find a way to go. I feel really good about this. I'm doing really well. I want to take more math. Uh, we try to make that happen for them as well, too. Uh, there are students who request to take things over the summer. Uh, we have a student, uh, every now and then we have a couple of students who request to take a couple of math courses simultaneously. Uh, we, like I said, we try to give them as much, uh, as much uh, flexibility as possible. Thank you so much. And Will, can you talk a bit about the science program? Sure. Um, so I'm actually going to drop a link in the chat 
Um, so this is a handout that we give out um, during admissions. It kind of shows that the science department is a department of departments. So we have biology, chemistry, physics, earth science, and environmental science, and engineering. And so ninth grade students coming in all take biology. Uh, it's designed both as an intro to science, but it's also a ninth grade experience where students are exposed to a lot of core skills, um, being discerner, uh, discerners and skeptical intakers of information, presenting that information well, and then kind of establishing a good foundation to move on to 10th grade year where they can go into either chemistry or earth science. And then as you move past 10th grade year, it really opens up to be what you want to make and what passions you want to pursue. So some students take physics, some do environmental science, advanced earth science, advanced bio, advanced chem, chemistry of cooking, uh, astronomy, engineering, what have you. And so we really want to help pursue and develop people as scientists and learners, but also allow them to pursue their passions content-wise. Uh, the graduation requirement is five semesters of science, two and a half years, um, though most students take science every single semester, so eight semesters. We've had students who, who in the process of doubling up, um, have taken 10 or 12 semesters of science during their time here at CA. And so that's, I think, one of the great things about us as a department, but also see as a whole, is the flexibility to really pursue your passion and make your education your own. Thank you so much for that overview. And Ben, can you talk a bit about computer science? Sure. I'm also going to put a link in the chat just to our course catalog section. Um, this is a department that has been around for 20 plus years, um, one of the earliest schools to actually establish a computer science department in the um, in the private school uh, arena. Um, we've had many uh, teachers teach in our, in our school for a long time, but I teach most of the upper level computer science classes here myself. Um, we're talking about a student that would enter with something like a creative computing and apps and computing creative creativity class. Um, that they can place up into other classes from that course if they want to, um, if they already have those skills. A typical student would come in, if they're already like a coder, they might skip the first course and go straight into object-oriented programming, um, which maps uh, very loosely to the uh, uh, advanced placement test. Um, we, we then have students can, that can take graph design. There's actually an English class that maps to computer science too from an, a teacher that was um, in both departments. And we have a uh, CAD CAM class that crosses into the science department. Um, that uh, has a lot of computer science elements to that as well. Um, the, the sort of top elective in the class rotates every three years in the in the department. Um, so there'd be a if it rotates between a machine learning and big data rotation, and then um, the next year that the, it would turn into a game design or a game programming course, and the next year it turns into a mobile apps course. Um, we find ourselves with a lot of students that um, do independent studies and senior projects, and then we love to. Um, to work with other departments uh, to do tech related projects. So this last year we did an amazing project with the history department where we had kids create an augmented reality app on their that ran on phones and let you experience the history of Concord through an iPhone app. Um, actually it ran on all platforms. So that was really awesome. So um, happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna ask um, each of our panelists to respond to one of two possible questions. And then when they are done responding to those um, prompts, we encourage our audience to send in questions through the chat and we will do our very best to get to all of your questions. Um, so for our panelists, I'll ask you to respond to one of two prompts, either do you have a favorite course that you teach at CA, or what is your favorite thing about teaching at CA? Kim, can I start with you? Sure. Um, that's an, uh, uh, there's only one question I could answer, and that is what's my favorite course that, that I, I like to teach at CA, and that's biology, because I love working with new students as they come into CA and help them figure out how to, to best learn. I think it's also, you know, the way I can infuse the academic support center in uh, with my work with, uh, with the biology students. So it's just, it's really fun to just figure out where students have come from and help them connect with um, learning within the science department, learning a challenging course uh, and being creative about it and just seeing them grow. Thank you, Susan. Hi, um, 
I get most excited about uh, our people, our students, and our and my colleagues that I I get to, an opportunity to work with. Um, I get most excited about teaching courses um, like my electives, chemical cooking and developmental biology that are largely um, hands-on wet labs or um, kitchen labs in some cases uh, where students can design their own experiments and have a lot of time um, working and sorting through data that they collect themselves. It's I find that most exciting. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, I'm a little torn. I, I both really like working with ninth graders, the sort of enthusiasm and helping them adjust to CA, but in terms of content, I think um, the advanced topics electives are my favorite to do and have students pursue very abstract theoretical things and sort of have the experience of what it's like to be a mathematician. Thank you. Will, did you want to respond to one of those questions? Sure. Um, I think one of my favorite things about teaching at CA is just how engaged the students are and how the love of learning really does kind of diffuse through everything that is done. Um, but at the same time, that same passion is something that we're allowed to pursue as teachers, where not only do we want students to pursue what they want, um, but we have the opportunity to do things that haven't necessarily been done before. So this year, for example, my advanced chemistry class in the fall, we taught, uh, our, I'm teaching, I don't know why I said we, uh, I'm teaching an organic chemistry semester elective, um, which has just been a really fun thing to develop on the fly. So I think that passion uh, comes through from both teachers and students in a way that's just so fun and enjoyable. Thank you, George. Oh, well, I, I teach a whole smattering of courses and I love all of them. I love my Algebra 1 students. Uh, I, I, I should say, yeah, I like my Algebra 1 course because of my Algebra 1 students. They're just a joy to work with. Uh, they're, they're very excitable. They're, they're, they're motivated workers. They, they're, they're just fun kids to have in the class. And, and it's a joy to work, walk in them uh, with, and work with them. Uh, my my calculus-based statistics, so that's uh, an advanced topic. So it's largely, June, uh, excuse me, mostly seniors, but some juniors. Uh, that class is for the students who are really, 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 they want their, they, they want to get the most out of mathematics. And uh, so I teach them really high, it's hard, high level stuff, uh, stuff that I learned, you know, well into college and they eat it up. Uh, and they meet with me outside of class to, to talk more about it. Uh, they see how applied it is. Uh, and I love my discrete math class. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a class where we bring math and science together. Um, and uh, actually in some computer science as well. And it's a lot of fun to see the kids find, discover these things that they didn't really understand before. And you see all these sorts of light bulbs go on and, and that's, that, that's a real joy for me. Thank you so much, Ben. One of the things that makes the world of computer science really work um, and, and innovation constantly happen is when students are constantly tinkering and trying things out that they might just be curious about playing with. Um, there's a lot of playful computer science that happens in and out of my classroom at, at this school. There's something like six or seven clubs that infuse computer science into their mission. You know, there's a club that does you know, robotics, there's a club that does machine learning, there's just a programming club that sort of does everything. There's a club that's called gender representation and technology, where they're really trying to bring non white male, you know, students into the fold of, tech, of computer science and technology and STEM. Um, and we have, you know, a, a club that's based in game programming and game design. And so these kids are just like obsessed with this stuff all the time. And they're always trying to play with new ideas. Um, and they get really good at it. Um, I think the class that I've had the most fun teaching is always the one that I that gets reinvented every year. Um, and the only way that's even possible is because I um, often draw on the expertise of some senior that I've gotten to know over the course of four years and brings some incredible expertise to the classroom with me. So they'll they'll sometimes really help me teach the class to a bunch of younger students. And that could be, you know, a, a big data class. We did machine learning classes. We've done classes when Android programming first came out. We did that. We did Ruby when it first came out. We did Google's language Go when it first came out. So we were really always on the, on the top kind of bleeding edge of what um, you can do with computer science. And that is a blast for me because I get to um, be learning it as fast as possible so that I can then pass that information on to other kids. 
Thank you so much. Um, and I encourage our audience to um, put questions into the chat. And our first question is about extracurricular activities related to math and science. So Ben, I think you covered a bunch in uh, your comments, but did anyone have other clubs or organizations that specifically relate to their areas? Yes, Will. Um, so one of, I think, the perennial uh, big clubs on campus is what is referred to as DEMONS. And so uh, it, it stands for Dreamers, Engineers, Makers, and Overt Nerds Club, um, which I think is just such a lovely acronym of all of the excellent people that are involved in that, including the person who is one of the advisors to the club, uh, Max Hall. And so these are people that kind of live in our maker space, and they're students that learn how to use the 3D printers and the uh, vinyl cutters and the glow forges and all of these different things. And they actually get projects that come to them. So one of the ones this year is they're actually working on building a new bike shed uh, for the campus. Um, or a couple of years ago, this group was donated a uh, a uh, computer controlled plasma cutter. It was in pieces and over the past several years they've been building it and they've actually taken the 3D printers to print pieces to build the plasma cutter that they'll then cut those pieces out of aluminum to replace the plastic pieces that are kind of assembling it. Um, and so that's kind of the big club, but I think to Ben's point, there's so many clubs that kind of come into existence because of student interest. So we have science club and that varies from being more kind of bio oriented to chem oriented, depending on the students who are interested. Um, we have a science ethics club that was started a couple of years ago because of one lesson that we had in one chemistry class that they had. Um, we have medical club and they've done a lot of work with vaccine um, campaigns to try to help raise awareness about vaccines and boosters. And so I think there are so many excellent clubs that kind of come into existence and I actually don't know that I can keep track of them. Um, Green club and uh, there was a physics club that somebody wanted to start recently and I'm blanking on the name, but there are just so many of these clubs that kind of are happening that I think we're not always aware of because students go, oh, I want to start a club. And that's really kind of it. They go, they check in with student life office, they try to find a faculty advisor, but the faculty aren't leading this. It's really student driven, student led and student propelled in a way that's really organic and wonderful to see. Thank you. And George and Sean, did you want to add anything about extracurricular math? Sure, if I could, I, I, uh, I, I'm the faculty advisor of the Big Data Club. Um, I'm also technically also the advisor to the Chameleon, <laughs> to the Chameleon Composers Club and to the, uh, to the Investment Club as well. Um, but the, uh, the Big Data Club is just is, is a group of kids. Uh, well, it was founded by two students who came up to me and they said, we love data analytics. <laughs> we want to do more of it. And uh, so we started collecting uh, data sets and we got a lot of interest. Uh, and so over the years, we just keep collecting data sets and analyzing them. You just put it up and say, oh, what, what do we got here? And for a while there, we were also exploring different tools for graphing uh, and for illustrating the, uh, what our, you know, our findings. Um, last year, we were looking at uh, energy usage by Concord Academy. So you know, I was taking kids <laughs> into the basements of these buildings and we're looking at the meters, you know, the electric meter, the water meter, the gas meter. And we're recording things over time um, uh, to see how that, how, you know, like the temperature might affect those, uh, you know, those the, the, our energy usage. This year, we're we were looking uh, we we're looking at the dining hall, uh, how many how many uh, how many plates are getting used at different meals, and we're looking at the different days of the week and saying, what are we seeing here? And then someone pointed out, oh, you know what? I think these breakfast numbers vary, uh, particularly on that day, we were really low because the train was late. And then we said, oh, how is the train affecting? Our our breakfast numbers, and then we started getting these train <laughs> late. <day. laughs> uh, the MBTA app uh, has all the you know the, the 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 times for the trains and how late they they have been over the last two weeks. It's just uh, kids who can't get enough of looking at data sets and, and wanting to explore. Wow, what do we got here? Thank you so much, Susan. As someone who's interested in learning more about the chemistry of cooking, I suspect it's more than one person that wants to know about that. <laughs> it's um, an elective uh, course of applied chemistry, and um, I teach it in the fall semester. And each week we try to, or I try to, um, perform a lab in the lab with test tubes and um, heating blocks and things like that, um, looking at the different um, physical and chemical changes that 
are really at some level almost an alchemy that creates uh, the food that we enjoy so much. Um, and then once a week, we also perform a lab in the Bailey Commons, which is um, the Haynes and Hobson house kitchens that has a, a wall that opens up between them. So we have two kitchens and students um, uh, prepare recipes that um, sometimes I choose to illustrate um, the chemical um, um, reactions that occur in different kinds of leavenings, or um, today's uh, lab was uh, student designed, and they were all looking to do experiments with apples in different ways, and they could choose the variable and choose the recipe. So it's very hands on, and um, they'll be working on a lab report about that, but um, they're very excited and it's delicious. Thank you. There's a question in the chat asking about math and science courses for AP credit. And I'm wondering if one of you would like to explain CA's approach to um, AP classes, um, specifically the reason that we don't have them, um, but then some of the preparation we do if students are interested in taking the exam. Sean, yes, thank you. And, well, George actually offers an advanced statistics course that um, aligns somewhat with the AP curriculum. And we also offer three semesters of calculus, calculus A, B, and C that align pretty well with the AP. Um, as a school, we don't intentionally try to align with the AP, but in calculus, it just so happens that it tends to. Um, and those of us teaching Calc B or Calc C in the spring tend to offer um, resources during the semester, but also like my colleague Howie Bloom, who's been teaching here for 40 years, he'll usually offer a three hour review on the weekend before the AP exam for those who are interested in taking it, because we still do get quite a few students that are interested in taking those exams. Um, I, I can jump in too. So in science, uh, some of our classes align in ways that map up reasonably well for students who are interested. Some of our classes don't, so I can speak to our advanced physics classes usually line up pretty well. So electricity and magnetism maps onto the physics C test. Um, but as a school, we don't really align ourselves with the AP curriculum. We don't really necessarily encourage people to pursue those, in part because the APs aren't really focused on student understanding or necessarily love of learning or the kind of the things we hope students learn or develop or cultivate it during their time here at CEA. Um, and also partly it's because we hire people who are excellent teachers and the AP is kind of a cookie cutter curriculum that um, doesn't necessarily allow those teachers to demonstrate their passions. And it's more a, here's the bucket of stuff you have to do every week. Please make sure to get through the bucket before next week's bucket of information arrives. And it can be in some ways much more memorizationally oriented than one would necessarily want to see. And in terms of the chemistry I can speak to um, during my time when I was at Boston University, the chemistry department actually no longer offered credit for the AP chem test, regardless of your score. And I think that is a trend for some departments in terms of AP at the college level, where it's not necessarily aligned with what colleges are looking for in terms of a good student or a student that has knowledge in that subject, just because it, really colleges want, as a former mentor of mine described, people who can think. And the AP curriculum doesn't necessarily help foster that in the way that colleges are looking for. Um, and so people that you know take the AP chem test, which you can do if you take both semesters of advanced chemistry, um, and people have done reasonably well, colleges still want to have you take a take their courses in that subject, but also they don't necessarily feel as though it's a good indicator of comparability between what was what is offered in their classes and what the AP is covering. And so we prefer as a school, I think, to offer classes that are more engaging, more um, kind of depth over just breadth of information, and really trying to get help students see the, the whys of how all of this works instead of just the, here's more information, try to uh, internalize it before the test. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question about how much project-based learning is incorporated into the classes. And I'm not sure if that is specifically directed to a particular department. So I'm gonna toss that out for anyone to respond to. 
So project-based learning incorporated in a class uh, versus just studying theory. I can definitely speak to that one in the computer science department. Almost everything we do in that department is based in projects. Um, this last year, we did this course that was all about making this app that I just mentioned, where students are taking the, the research from various parts of conquered history and figuring out ways to break into teams. And, and each person took on us a, a portion of this app design. And there were people who made a map of the of the campus and of the town. And there was another group that like deal, dealt with green screen videoing and other another group that dealt with um, the code that underlies the object, the, uh, the augmented reality technology. And ultimately, we came out with this amazing thing that we could then show to people at our centennial event, our alumni community, all the people from the Concord Museum came and looked at it. So it was hugely project oriented. Um, and then every year um, when we have our big data class, we connected with our summer camp program, which is this incredibly great summer camp that happens here on campus. But they have all this data that they're looking at to try and become better. And our students looked at that data set and did amazing things with that in the big data class. So we're always looking for not just project-based work, but real-world project-based work. Thank you. And George, you spoke to some of the real-world applications of your statistics course as well. So, um, there is a student asking, uh, or there are actually a few related questions to um, scheduling and placement in biology as the ninth grade default science course. And if a student has taken a full high school level biology course, again, what might help them place out of that? And generally just how do we go about scheduling for new students? So um, let's talk about that in math first. Sean and George, can you talk a little bit about your placement process for math students? Uh, yeah, we have students take a placement test uh, before they arrive, and through um, temporary advisors through the school, sort of communicate with them and their families about sort of how that went, what we suggest they take. Um, inevitably, there are students, I did advise you this year, a new ninth grader who still felt like they weren't quite in the right math class, and so we talked to the math department head and did another placement test and they were right, and now they're in a different math class. So we, we try and meet them where they're at. They place across a whole variety of courses and levels, and if they get here and find that they, they think that maybe they were misplaced, maybe they learned a bit more math after they did the placement test, we're willing to take a look and work with them. Thank you. And Ben, you also have a placement test for the creative computing class. That's right. And students can take that and it takes about an hour and they turn it into me. Um, and uh, if they place, I place them into a higher level courses immediately. Um, most of our courses have no prerequisites anyway, but it allows them to, to change their requirement. They have a one semester requirement and that could either be the intro level class or they can place into a higher level class and meet the requirement that way. Thank you. And then um, for the science faculty, the default ninth grade course um, is biology. I'm not sure if the student asking that question is applying to repeat ninth grade or to enter in 10th grade, but if you could talk a little bit about that ninth grade biology um, and then what happens after that. So um, all new ninth grade students take biology. Um, if a student is a repeat ninth grader or a new 10th grader and they've already done biology, um, they usually start either in earth science or chemistry. Um, and some students have done biology in uh, some biology work in their middle school, and they may see some work that is kind of repetitious content wise, but we're hoping both skill wise and deepening of content wise that stuff is new for them. Even if they seen stuff at the middle school level, the ninth grade biology course will be um, new for them. Um, Thank you. And for our audience in general, um, Sean had mentioned the temporary advisor. So, um, after students are admitted and enrolled, very shortly after that, um, families will hear from the academic office um, about the course scheduling process. Um, and as part of that process, um, new students and their families are matched with a temporary advisor um, who helps to be a resource and a guide for them while um, the student and the family are going through the course placement process and the course preference process. 
process. Um, so one of the things we're really proud of at Concord Academy is the amount of choice that we offer students. Um, and in no way do we want that um, choice to feel overwhelming and daunting in any way. So there's a lot of support both coming in as a new student and then in subsequent years for returning students going through a really thoughtful and careful course selection process with their advisors. Um, and there's um, some questions, some interest in our sort of earth and environmental science courses. I think Will, actually, I, I'm not sure I could answer very many questions about them. Could you, Susan? Um, you know, I could say he's going to be back on. I think he's um, he sent me a message that said that he's um, on duty on campus and he's getting a call. Yeah, so we'll that, be right back. So we'll, we'll hold figured. that question for now. Like, yeah, um, I think that's good. Ben, would you like to talk a bit about the gaming course? Yeah, sure. I saw that question in the chat. Um, I would love to talk about that class. Kids have made amazing games over the years. We we actually um, did that class in in five or six different languages over the last uh, decade or two. Um, the most recent one was Pi Game, which is a, a Python library that lets you make games that way. And kids made sort of 2D and 3D games. We've used Unity over the years, which um, involves some Java at the in the back in the days. It involved some JavaScript or Unity script, and then moved into uh, C sharp and C plus um, plus or uh, type language for Unity. And then we. Um, over the years, we used Google's Go to actually write games, which was um, pretty challenging because it was a fairly new language at the time. And then um, back in the day, we used uh, we actually used a functional language. Um, if anybody, if those of you that are listening knows what Haskell is, it's actually a very tricky language to learn. And uh, I had a student that I could actually um, write quite effectively in Haskell, and we together managed to take kids through a, a gaming um, environment called Elm that is like very Haskell-like that got kids to write games functionally, which is if any of you know what functional languages are, that's an incredibly hard thing to do in high school. And it was really fun for the kids to check that out. So happy to take more questions about game programming. It's one of my favorite classes to teach. It's really one thing I should say about it is it's really not about the games. It's about learning how to do effective coding and design and um, and also figuring out how to um, how to solve problems. And so kids got really good at that. Thank you. Um, Will, could you talk a bit about the Earth and Environmental Studies courses? Yeah. Um, sorry, everybody. So as mentioned, I'm a house affiliate tonight. It was my duty and a student was having an issue, so I just had to take the call. Um, so our Earth and Environmental Science uh, sub-department, uh, Earth Science, we have uh, Natural Hazards and Evolution of a Habitable, habitable Planet are the two semester courses there. Our Advanced Environmental Science classes, we have human ecology this semester. Next semester, we have sustainable agriculture. Those alternate with a water conflicts class and a, um, there's a fourth class and I'm currently blanking on it. Uh, it is on the handout, let's see. Uh, not coming up just at this moment, but there are four of those classes um, that alternate in different cycles. And then there's also the opportunity for students to pursue um, oh, energy and climate, that's the fourth one. Um, pursue other avenues of interest, both in the context of Green Club or as an environmental uh, co-head or through environmental work on campus, especially as part of CA's um, sustainability efforts and um, the green initiatives on campus that also interface with some of the work coming from Big Data Club, um, just to circle back to that, where they have looked at CA's emissions and those sorts of things. And there's actually a student who was in one of those environmental science classes that did some analysis and from that work, uh, CA is installing some really big fans. Uh, the company name, pardon my language, is actually big ass fans. And those are going into the shack gym um, to help with the heating and cooling in that space that should actually save huge amounts of energy for that really large volume of um, the gym. Um, and then there are also opportunities for senior projects or independent study work as well. Thank you so much. There are some questions in the chat about um, our schedule, and I think that that will be a, um, a lot to take on in this particular format tonight while we're getting so many 
department specific questions, but I'm going to handle the question in this way. Um, first, to explain to the audience that we have classes that are determined to or um, classified as either major courses or minor courses. Um, and major courses meet three times a week. And typically, those are classes in the five main academic disciplines of English, history, science, math, and language. And then minor courses, which meet two times a week. And um, those are typically courses in um, the visual and performing arts. Ben, the computer science classes are majors yes. or minors? Minors. Minors, okay. So those are meeting two times a week. And would anyone like to speak to the benefits of how um, for those major discipline courses, meeting three days a week in longer blocks, what you see is the advantage of that structure rather than meeting for five shorter blocks a week. Um, I, so, sorry, can we- can no, go? Yeah. go for it. Uh, I was just gonna say, I think uh, for some of our lab sciences, the longer blocks allow us to do some things that would be really hard and compressed and would be, I think, perforce kind of more cookie cutter experiments. But with a longer block, that kind of allows you time for things to evolve and kind of, oh, what's going to happen in a way that I think is really fantastic and uh, exciting. It also allows you with that time as a student, I think, to have some intensive work, but then you have time for your brain to kind of digest that material between class meetings in a way that I think is great for uh, just enriching one's understanding of the material. That's that's the point that I was going to make. Having having the, the time between classes to let um, information just kind of settle uh, a little bit. Um, and then also the longer blocks allows us, um, particularly like in bio, for students to have a variety of different experiences so we can um, engage them in a variety of different ways so that they're not, um, uh, you know, we're, we're teaching in different modalities so that we can engage students in different ways, right? So it makes it interesting and they can they can explore things deeply, but not in an exhaustive way. <laughs> Um, but so it, it, it allows for a lot of flexibility. Thank you so much. Um, and I am, someone has asked questions about some um, upper level independent work that students might have done. Ben, I know you've supervised um, some students in upper level work in computer science. Yes, I sure have. It happens uh, really often in computer science. Kids can, there's just so many amazing ways for students to go study computer science on their own and also work with me to get into um, higher level um, experiments, higher level coding work. Uh, they'll do internships in the summer. Um, we have a program called Inspire where students will do STEM based um, internships their junior summer and go off and work with either like the Tufts University lab has a, takes a lot of our students so they'll typically work either in academic labs or in corporate work where they're um, helping with machine learning or they're helping with some kind of experiment that they're, that's happening and they'll do some of the computation for that. Um, I also love to work every year with a student that has decided to do something um, extra with coding. And so I had a kid one year that actually, this was last year, made a, made a program. He wanted to look at um, a traffic cam data and figure out how to use um, image analysis to actually determine the speed of the vehicles that were going by a traffic camera, which is um, took a lot of uh, intense image recognition work. And um, we have students every year that do stuff like that. A girl that just um, came back from the summer having done an independent study with me uh, where she looked at antibiotic resistance and actually helped publish a paper that was um, co-signed by many graduate students. It was really exciting to see the work um, of this student. And so um, every year I welcome students to, to de propose departmental studies with me and I meet with them weekly and they, they take me through um, what they're doing and I give them advice about um, potential frameworks to use, code uh, ideas to use, ways to solve problems and, and potentially connections they could work with um, in the industry. Thank you. And um, I'm wondering if there are any examples from science or math for independent studies or senior projects. Um. I'm working with a student this uh, semester who um, wants to quantify the amount of microplastics in the Sudbury. So we're going to take various samples of water from different points at the Sudbury. And she found her own protocol that she wants to do for how to quantify this. So 
We're going to do a couple of control experiments to make sure we have the methodology down. And then um, we're actually going to um, go collect those samples. And she also wants to try to do it at like the outflow um, where it connects with another body of water. And so um, I think that's a really fun project. I also had a student who set out, he wanted to um, learn about how one teaches and uh, more about chemistry. And it started out as putting together a couple of curriculum materials for a class, and it evolved into a 200 page textbook that he wrote. And we had a check in meeting where I was like, hey, you haven't really shared anything with me. And he goes, oh, I'll share the file with you on Google Docs. And he shared it with me, and it was 200 plus pages. And I went, this is great. I will never have a chance to read through and actually proof all of this, but this is amazing. So I think that's one of the things where people just pursue all these great ideas that are passions. Thank you. Um, someone in relation to the um, question about schedule, I think has asked the question if um, all classes run just in semesters or are some year long? And the answer is yes, both. Um, and it depends on the course and the department. Um, so for example, all of our history courses are semester long. Science classes can be year long. So for example, our biology, our non-biology course is a year long course. Um, and some of the upper level electives are semester based. Um, I think all of the math classes are semester based. Is that correct? Um, language classes are year long up through level three. And then we go to an elective based um, program for upper level language study. And so those are all semester long courses. So it really depends. And that's part of um, the course scheduling process and part of how the academic advisors and the academic office really work with students to help put together um, a class schedule that works and that has all those pieces fit. So um, so we are getting to the end of our time tonight. And I'm so grateful to our audience for all your wonderful question questions. We've done our best to get to all of them. I think we may have missed a few. And I'm going to put my email address into the chat. So please feel free to reach out to me in the coming days if I can help direct any department specific questions for you or answer any admissions specific questions for you. Um, and I'd love to run through just um, our panelists really quickly with just um, a nice way to close with what is your favorite CA tradition? Sean. Um, senior chapels getting to you know see the difference of someone who I taught in ninth grade and then their journey through here and then for some students sometimes it's my only opportunity to sort of get to know them thank you Susan favorite CA tradition sorry mine also has to be chapel I think of it as a a wonderful place I, I sometimes call it an empathy lab um, where students share their stories with um, all of us. And I love that. Though I love advisories as well. It's not a tradition, but it's a built-in part of um, uh, working with students. And, and, and I treasure that too. And those advisories are when we each um, meet one-on-one -on -one at least once a week with um, each of our advisees. So it's a really special opportunity to work closely and get to know students really closely. Kim, favorite CA tradition? Oh, I, I would say chapel uh, for sure and the advisory. So if I was going to add a, a, another one that was different. Third choice. Think, yeah, I, my third choice would be orientation, crazy enough, um, because it's just such a great time to meet students as they're, as they're coming into CA and they're all excited and we're just trying to you know, wrap them up with big supportive arms and, and help get them ready for an exciting year ahead. George, CA tradition? Well, it's hard to chap top the chapel, uh, but I, there are a number of things I like. I, I like the I like the uh, the senior faculty dinner at uh, the end of the year. I like the hug line after graduation. <laughs> uh, I like the red blue day, which is that's that's a whole thing uh, where we all the kids get together and have a lot of fun outside. Uh, yeah. Will? Um, chapel and advisor are definitely up there. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. 
Um, I was actually sad I wasn't called on first because I knew it was going to be a common refrain, but I would build on that by saying I, I actually really love the tradition that we uh, students and faculty are on first name basis. I think it really does help build those connections, those relationships, those chances for students to just come with, hey, I have this random idea. And sometimes it's a random idea where we're like, oh, interesting. And sometimes it's a random idea which becomes you know, something they end up pursuing as a passion. Um, so I, I think it just helps foster those those close student faculty relationships that just make CA such a, a lovely place. Thank you. Ben, you get to close. Oh, good. I have one for sort of each of the areas that I really love working uh, in the school. And I, uh, for computer science, we have something called Tech Expo, which is where all the students really show off their work at the end of the year and everybody comes and checks out all the amazing innovation. Um, in my sort of visual arts role, I get to be part of the film assembly where kids get to show all their films. Um, and it's a big show that happens twice a year. And we just get everybody goes into the huge um, assembly room and watches films. And then with my Model UN kids on Saturday night, we always take them out to dinner um, at some fancy restaurant that's paid for by our own conference that we run here at Concord Academy. And then for my soccer kids, we have this amazing thing called the Chandler Bowl, where all of our teams go and compete against all of the teams at Pingree. And we've won it six years in a row. And we're really proud of that. And it's just a fun um, tradition every year. So um, yeah, lots of good ones here. Chapels are good too. Thank you so much. And um, to my colleagues, thank you so much for joining me and sharing so much about your love for teaching and your love for CA and your enthusiasm around your departments. And to our audience, thank you for your time and your attentiveness and your great questions. And we hope you'll keep them coming. Uh, we look forward to helping you get to know more about CA. Good night, everyone. Good night.